Our proclamation tonight is taken from Isaiah chapter 57, verse 50, and 66, verse 2. Thus says the High and Lofty One, who inhabits eternity, whose name is Holy. I dwell in the high and holy place with him who has a contrite and humble spirit to revive the spirit of the humble and to revive the heart of the contrite one. This is the one I esteem, he who is humble and contrite in spirit and trembles at my word. Now I just have to uh, mention two pieces of material that are re- available from our ministry, uh, which I think could be of significant help to those of you who are pastoring a flock. The first is called Self-Study Bible Course, and I think it was first born about 1959 as a Bible correspondence course mm. in East Africa. But Ultimately, it became a self-study Bible course, and uh, there's instructions, there's direction to passages of Scripture, there are questions, and there are guides to where to find the answer. But you have to fill in the answer for yourself. So, it obligates people to search the Bible for themselves. There also is a coordinated system of memorizing. I was speaking about how important it is to have the scripture in our hearts and minds. And this is one very practical way. Once you give people a taste for scripture memorization, many of them will go on doing it automatically. And then the second one is kind of a more advanced study called In Search of Truth. The byline is a step-by-step guide to security and personal fulfillment. The history of this is that we decided that we would produce the self-study Bible course in Hebrew for the Jewish people. But when I began to look at it, I realized that there's a difference. It became so real to me that Paul says there's a gospel of the circumcision and a gospel of the uncircumcision. The message is the same, but the approach is different. You can't approach Jewish people who've had a history with Abraham and Moses and David and all their literature, just as if they didn't know anything about God. So, with a friend of mine who is a a Messianic Jewish pastor, we worked on the first five chapters to introduce by way of Abraham and Moses. Mm. And my friend said to me afterwards, after he had worked this through, he said, after I've worked on those five chapters, there is no way I could ever doubt that Jesus is the Messiah. Mm. So there are those two which are available, and, uh, and we invite you to check on them for yourself. Now, You've all been so wonderfully responsive and encouraging that I'm encouraged this evening to embark on an awesome question. What is holiness? (laughs) I'm amazed at my chutzpah. You know what the word chutzpah is? No, you don't. Um, What is chutzpah? There's no way to tell you what chutzpah is. <laughs> but uh, my nerve, to use an American slang phrase, or my audacity, or my presumption, to even approach this question. But I felt that I was prompted by God. Uh, the Hebrew language is a very interesting language. It's interesting because it's entirely built on words of three letters. All the roots in Hebrew are three letters. And it's like God is saying, I'm a triune God. This is where it begins. I mean, everything about Hebrew speaks about God. 
And um, the word for holy in Hebrew is kadosh. There's a chorus that a lot of people sing today, kadosh, 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 which has the three letters, kuf, which is the Q sound, dalit, which is the D sound, and she, which is the S-H sound. Let me comment on this strange fact that I don't know all the historical reasons. But the Old Testament scriptures came to us by way of a Greek, of a Greek culture. And Greek is a totally in a, unsuitable language to present Hebrew in. Because Greek has no S-H sound. So the one who was Yeshua becomes Jesus. You get a totally inadequate picture of what the Hebrew scriptures say when they are presented in the light of Greek linguistics and culture. So, the question is then, what is holiness? First of all, let me tell you what it is not. This is very important because I think basically many Christians have an idea that holiness is a set of rules about where you may go and what you may eat and how you may dress. And that has nothing to do with holiness. And Paul is very emphatic about that. In Colossians chapter 2, verse 20 and following. <clears throat> Therefore, if you died with Christ from the basic principles of the world, why, as though living in the world, do you subject yourselves to regulation? Do not touch, do not taste, do not handle. That's the religious version of holiness, subjecting yourself to regulation. And then he goes on, which all concern things which perish with the using. And it's according to the commandments and doctrines of men. These things indeed have an appearance of wisdom in self-imposed religion, false humanity, and neglect of the body but are of no use against the indulgence of the flesh. And this is so profoundly true. The more you focus on the things you must not do, the more power they have over you. You must not lose your temper. You must not lose your temper. You must not lose your temper. And what the next thing you do is lose your temper, see? Because you're focusing on the wrong thing. Now, this traditionally, at least in Britain and America, has been for many people the picture of what holiness is. And it turns people off. Mm -hmm. If that's holiness, I don't want to have anything to do with it. Now, let me prove to you that is not the holiness which the Bible speaks about, because in Hebrews chapter 12 and verse 10, Speaking about the discipline that God as a father deals with his children, it says, for they are human fathers. Indeed, for a few days chastened us to seem best to them, but God for our profit, that we may be partakers of his holiness. Obviously, that has got nothing to do with a set of rules. God isn't holy because he as a set of rules up in front of him, which he checks his own conduct with. It has nothing to do with biblical or divine holiness. Now, I am just suggesting for a moment you consider this, that holiness is the essence of what God is. And what only God is. No one and nothing else is holy. And everything about God is holy. So in order to have any kind of understanding of holiness, we have to have an understanding of God, who he is, what he's like. So I'm going to give you a list. It works out there are seven things, which satisfies me, I'm sure I'm on the right course. Uh, of the what we call the attributes of God, or things that the Bible says God is. And I believe holiness is the summation of all God's attributes. And it cannot be explained, it cannot be defined, can only be revealed.
There is no other way by which we can come to understand holiness except by direct revelation from God. <coughs> now these are the things. First of all, God is light. In 1 John 1, verse 5, John says, This is the message which we have heard from him and declare to you that God is light and in him is no darkness at all. So God is light. Not merely that he created light or sends light forth, but he himself is light. And then, a little further on in the same epistle, the first chapter, first epistle of John, chapter 4, and verse 8 and verse 16. He who does not love does not know God, for God is love. And verse 16, we have known and believed the love that God has for us. God is love. And he who abides in love abides in God and God in him. So God is both light and love. Now, John Wesley's suggested definition of holiness was perfect love, which is a wonderful thought, but I don't believe it's adequate as a definition. And then there's this, as it were, this tension between light and love. Light scares you, love draws you. And I think that there is this tension in our relationship with God. We want to come close to him, but we cannot face the light. Then, God is a God of justice and judgment. This is absolutely part of his nature. In the Song of Moses, Deuteronomy 32, Moses starts by emphasizing this. Moses says in Deuteronomy 32, verses 3 and 4, For I proclaim the name of the Lord, ascribe greatness to our God. He is the rock, his work is perfect, for all his ways are justice, a God of truth and without injustice, righteous and upright is he. Many, many people accuse God of injustice, sometimes in our own situation or circumstances. But the Bible says there is no injustice in God. He is totally just. He's a God of truth. And then I like to quote also the words of Abraham in Genesis 18 when he was pleading with the Lord about Sodom. Genesis 18, verse 25. Abraham is speaking to the Lord and he says, Far be it from you to do such a thing as this, to slay the righteous with the wicked, so that the righteous should be as the wicked. Far be it from you, shall not the judge of all the earth do right. And that is who God is. He's the judge of all the earth, and he always does right. There is no injustice, no iniquity with him. We're often tempted to believe he's unjust. But the scripture affirms emphatically that is not true. Mm. Then I think something that contemporary Christianity hardly makes room for, but is very important. God is a God of anger and wrath. Mm. Nahum chapter 1 is really a remarkable presentation of this. Nahum chapter 1 just begins in a very abrupt way. There's no sort of nice introduction. It says, Nahum, chapter 1, verse 2. God is jealous, and the Lord avenges. The Lord avenges and is furious. The Lord will take vengeance on his adversaries, and he reserves wrath for his enemies. So, there we are. The Lord is angry, he's furious, He avenges himself. It's part of his divine, eternal nature. And if we leave that part out, we are not presenting a true picture of God. Today, 
the contemporary attitude is, well, if God should judge, at least he has to get our approval before he does it. <laughs> it's not so. That's right. And those who think that way are going to get a rude <laughs> shock. Yeah. But it'll be too late. Yeah. In Revelation 14, verses 9 and following. This is the judgment on the Antichrist. Verses 9 through 12. Then a third angel followed, saying with a loud voice, If anyone worships the beast and his image, and receives his mark on his forehead or on his hand, he himself shall also drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is poured out full strength into the cup of his indignation. And he shall be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the Lamb. And the smoke of their torment ascends for ever and ever. And they have no rest day or night who worship the beast and his image and whoever receives the mark of his name. And notice they shall be tormented in the presence of the Lamb. This does not fit the contemporary picture of gentle Jesus, meek and mild. But it's part of his divine, eternal character. He is a judge. I think about the Apostle John. At the last supper he reclined with his head on the chest of Jesus and whispered in his ear. He came so close. But in Revelation... In chapter 1, mm. when he had a <laughs> vision yes. of the Jesus as the judge, yes. mm. he fell at his feet yes. like one day. See, there's a many, many sides to the character and personality of God and of Jesus. Mm. And judgment and wrath are part of his eternal nature. And the judgment that he administers is eternal. They shall be tormented forever and ever. There is a theory current that God is too merciful ever to impose eternal punishment on anybody. So if people don't get reconciled with God, ultimately they will be annihilated. That's not scriptural. It's untrue. And furthermore, it's very dangerous. Yes, it is. I, I, would, I would never entertain such a thought. Because in the end of the book of Revelation, right near the end, in the last chapter, the last two verses, but two, the Lord is speaking and he says, I testify to everyone who hears the words of the prophecy of this book, if anyone adds to these things, God will add to him the plagues that are written in this book. And if anyone takes away from the words of the book of this prophecy, God shall take away his part from the book of life, from the holy city, from the things which are written in this book. And if anything is clearly written in this book of Revelation, it is that there is eternal judgment. So I don't want to take that away. Uh, I don't want my name to be taken away from the Book of Life. It's a very important issue for us today. See, humanism is so self-righteous, so, I would say, sloppy. It doesn't present uh, an accurate picture of the way things are. In fact, This is just a comment, by the way, but we are reaching a stage in society when society is much kinder to the criminal than to the victim. That's right. That's absolutely right. Why? We don't want to be judgmental. Mm -hmm. Why don't we want to be judgmental? My opinion is, secretly, in our hearts, we know if there's judgment for him, then there's judgment for me. (laughs) So I don't want it on him. I, I will arrange it otherwise, but God doesn't play that game. Amen. Then, another of the great attributes of God is mercy and loving kindness. 
And the word that's translated loving kindness is not translated the same. I think it says steadfast love, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, it, the Hebrew word is chesed. And uh, studying it, I came to the conclusion that what it really means is the covenant-keeping faithfulness of God. It's God's faithfulness to his covenant. And that's one of his great attributes. In Psalm 51, verse 1. This is a prayer of David, as you know, in time of deep distress, when his soul was hanging in the balance. Thank God he knew to whom to pray and to what, on what basis to pray. It's this prayer of repentance after his sin with Bathsheba and Uriah had been uncovered. He says, Have mercy upon me, O God, according to your loving kindness, according to the multitude of your tender mercies, blot out my transgressions. According to your loving kindness is your covenant-keeping faithfulness. Yeah. You've committed yourself to forgive if I meet the conditions. I'm appealing to you on that basis. How important it is to be able to approach God on that basis. It occurs in various other psalms, for instance, 106, the first verse. Praise the Lord. O oh, give thanks to the Lord, for he is good, for his mercy, his loving kindness, his faithfulness to his covenant endures forever. And in Psalm 107, I think it occurs six or seven times. So that is another aspect of God's eternal nature, his mercy. The writer of Hebrews says, let us come boldly to the throne of grace, that we may obtain mercy in time of need, and grace to help. So, the first thing we need is mercy, but then we need grace. Mm -hmm. And let's see what the Bible says about grace. Grace, one thing about grace is it cannot be earned. If, if you can earn it, it isn't grace. Mm. So religious people have a real problem because they think they've got to earn everything and consequently they tend to turn down the grace of God. If it is of grace, it is not of works. Paul says. If it is works, it is not of grace. There are two things there in that passage you can't earn. You can't earn mercy, you can't earn grace. Mm. The writer of Hebrews says, let us come boldly to the throne of grace, that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. Mm -hmm. We need mercy for the past, grace for the future, because it's only by God's grace that we can become the kind of people and live the kind of life that he requires of us. Mm -hmm. So God is a God of grace. And finally, in this little list, he is a God of power. The, the, the whole Bible is full of the records of his power. Let's just look in Psalm 93. Psalm 93. <coughs> the Lord reigns. He is clothed with majesty. The Lord is clothed. He has girded himself with strength. Surely the world is established that it cannot be moved. Your throne is established from of old, you are from everlasting. The floods have lifted up, O Lord, the floods have lifted up their voice, the floods lift up their waves. The Lord on high is mightier than the noise of many waters, than the mighty waves of the sea. And of course there are countless other passages that depict the power of God. Let me just recapitulate the seven, I would say, aspects of God's eternal nature. Number one, light. Number two, love. Number three, justice and judgment. Number four, anger and wrath. Number five, mercy, loving kindness, covenant keeping faithfulness. Number six, grace. Number seven, power. And I believe 